Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you, Moshe. And thank you for everybody at the Asset uh, Leadership Network. It's actually my second opportunity in a week to speak. And uh, we talked about real property uh, last week and uh, um, some initiatives we have there at DHS. And today we're, we're talking about uh, something that is uh, very much at the forefront of DHS and, and all agencies, uh, particularly law enforcement agencies, is the subject of, of PPE. Um, I, I see this as kind of an informal discussion. I, I have some slides, uh, but uh, I know Al Green, I know Eric Brown, I have a lot of experience with the department, uh, a lot more than I have, quite frankly. So, and, uh, and Jack Kelly's got the OMB experience and, and, and Moshe, of course. So, so please feel free to add in as you'd like. Um, and uh, next slide, please. So, so I, I, uh, I guess what, you know, what's, uh, why is, uh, Law enforcement, what's, what's the difference about law enforcement? Well, uh, law enforcement within DHS, we have many components, um, but the components that are primarily conducting law enforcement missions, and those missions don't stop during pandemics. So uh, the law enforcement mission continues and we have to be able department-wide to provide our frontline operators with uh, PPE to conduct, their, to conduct their operations safely. So that's, that's overall what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, let me, I'll skip around a little bit here, but uh, first of all, uh, I don't know, Jack, if you were at OMB back then, but, but uh, back in April, and I can't take credit for it, I just started working uh, at the CRSO office uh, in April, uh, but we did receive $178.3 million in CARES Act funding for PPE, and it's two-year money, which, which really helps us. It's not just one-year money, it's two-year money. Um, we received that funding and uh, over the years, uh, DHS had had some different approaches with uh, PPE. And, and again, I'll, I'll just talk to you a little bit of how I feel. One of the problems with PPE is it's relatively inexpensive. So it really, uh, despite everybody's best efforts, um, no matter how it was managed within the department, um, it was probably not the amount of oversight uh, that would be done should be should be more expensive equipment. And so once the pandemic's over, you know it's a, it's a, it's at the forefront. The pandemic's over. This a lot of this equipment's three dollars, four dollars, and you need so much of it. Um, uh, 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 DHS has tried a couple different uh, initiatives over the years, um, but essentially uh, even distributing them out to the components. But then there wasn't the oversight to make sure that the uh, PPE was still active in, in good equipment. It's, it's got a shelf life. So that, that's challenge, that's challenging as well. So you've got it. So long term, PPE is tough, is, is tough to manage from a departmental perspective. It's not high dollar. It's very critical when you need it. But when you don't need it, it's not it's not so critical. Um, but the, the decision was made for DHS to centrally DHS, our office to centrally manage the funding. That's a little different. We could have, for instance, taken 178.3 million, million and proportioned it out to the components. There's 12 act, well, there's 23 components, but I'll call them 12 law enforcement components. We could have done that. The decision was made to centrally manage it. And um, interestingly, uh, I call it the miracle of port. Um, the uh, folks that work for me and our, S and our systems folks came up and developed a system in, 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 in record time that allows us as an ordering process and tracking system for the PPE. So the components order it through port, we take it, we allocate it, send it over to the budget people, send it over to procurement people, and they go out and buy it in, in very simple terms. Um, but having said that, um, a port, uh, I call it the miracle port, I don't know how it was ever set up so quickly, but if you, you're familiar with uh, you know, mature logistics systems, Mature logistics systems are fully integrated. You got procurement is integrated. The warehousing is integrated. Um, you take, if you take something off the shelf, it's autom it automatically is recorded in the system. Ports, the standalone system, it doesn't talk to any other systems. So, that, so the good news is we're able to essentially manage it, but the challenge has been, it really doesn't connect to the components. So we're, or there's a lot of estimates going back and forth. Um, so, um, but, so that, that's going on, the port system was set up. Most importantly, we got, we got the funding, the port system was set up. And then um, the, the key to any initiative, I, I think anybody who's worked in government is partnerships. Um, we, we set up a task force. Again, uh, my folks who work in uh, logistics integration office 
And there's really only two guys, quite frankly, <laughs> fully, fully engaged with this. And each component, for instance, Al Green has a representative um, from ICE um, uh, that we, we call the PPE Task Force. And they meet once a week. And that's how we communicate back and forth on the uh, our critical priorities and the initiatives and any issues that's, that, that are being um, faced by the components um, with, co with the COVID-19 PPE distribution. And I think the other thing uh, we have to be careful about it at headquarters is we're not staffed to, you know, we don't do this on a daily basis. And, and, I, and I think anything from my perspective over the years that's done at headquarters, you, you, you got to be real careful. The whole idea is to get the get the get the um, proper equipment out to the components, and the further you're away you're away from the field, you lose that a little bit. And so that's been a little bit of a challenge too. It's not the fact we want to get it all in, in the system. We got to get it out to Al Green and his folks and and, and other folks so that so they can actually use it. And that, that's a little bit of a, a, a challenge, I think, when you when you try to run something from headquarters. But that's something I'm I'm, I'm very uh, cognizant of and we're working on. Uh, secondly, a vendor task force. Um, our folks, <laughs> again, just these two, these two folks are, are uh, constantly meeting uh, up to up to twice a week with vendors uh, across the government. Um, it's, it's we're in a tough situation. There's a high demand for the PPE, and the vendors, you know, and and, and the vendors. There's only so many vendors, and it's been. Well, I'll talk about that a little bit, but again, the partnership. And the fact that we centrally managed all of the input. So we're not ordering for just one organization within DHS. We're ordering for all the components. That does give us some leverage because there's, re there's real, um, you know, there's material amounts that we are, re request we are requesting for vendors. So that helps us with, with our leverage. Secondly, uh, quite frankly, uh, I, I do think uh, several vendors are really looking to help the country. And when they see a law enforcement agency needs PPE, they're willing to step up and perhaps, you know, they, they do, they do realize the importance. That's, that's helped us at all as well. Um, going down to the last bullet, what we, one of our, our, our most difficult initiatives is, is trying, uh, was, was uh, respirators. Um, <laughs> uh, again, a great demand for respirators and a limited amount of suppliers. Um, we've done a couple things. Uh, we had N95, what are called respirators, and, and that's what everybody w wants. It's OSHA certified. From FEMA, we were get we were getting K. We we were able to supplement that with KN95s. Not quite as effective, but does work for a lot of law enforcement operations. Um, secondly, uh, we uh, our folks did a great job with our procurement folks getting together with 3M and Honeywell, and now we are on a, a honey. Uh, 3M is delivering us 330 thousand a month for the next year. And Honeywell just delivered a seven million respirator. So we've gone from, I'd say in the, in the, in the July time frame, I didn't think we were going to have enough enough, enough ref, respirators to see us through the end of the year. Um, through a lot of hard work, through a lot of partnership with vendors, um, now we're getting complaints that the components warehouse don't have enough room for some of our uh, PPs. So that's that's a good problem to have. I, <laughs> if you're sitting in a warehouse, you're not that happy. But uh, certainly from my perspective, uh, uh, really happy to have that that problem compared to everything else we could be working with. Um, uh, next slide, please. Anybody have any questions on that at all? Um, and this is a slide presentation we actually sent to the Undersecretary of Management, uh, Tex Al's, uh, or presented to him, oh, two weeks ago. Uh, but the good news is, uh, we expended $20 million uh, and actually uh, that's a misleading figure. At the end of September, over $26 million of PP was delivered to components uh, throughout DHS and uh, um, obligated and coming down the road is another $60 million worth of material. So you can see where we, we, were, we thought we were short. Now, now I think we're a little bit more worried about when this 60 million Dollars worth of material starts. That pipeline really starts hitting. Are we going to have it? Going to have enough room? We'll, we'll figure that out. But uh, a much different problem than we had um, just uh, just just three or four months ago. And that uh, the breakdown of the product received is, is below that as well. The other thing is that's interesting is, is you've got unique component requirements. I mean, Secret Service is a component agency. Um, obviously, very high risk mission with the Secret Service. So gloves. 
how hard can gloves be? Well, there, there's like six or seven different types of sizes associated with gloves. And um, of course, trying to get the ones that uh, Secret Service would desire are the toughest to get. So those are the kind of little things behind the scene. We're working. Uh, we may go back to Secret Service, for instance, and say, uh, I know you really want six millimeter gloves thickness, but could you live with five millimeter? And then those, those are the type of things we're constantly doing with the components because the five million, five mil gloves we can get, the six mil gloves uh, is gonna be challenging. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, standing in the, uh, starting in FY21, um, I, I'll tell you one of the uh, challenges I came from the, I was the executive director of the Coast Guard Surface Forces Logistics Center. Uh, 1,800 people located all over the world supporting Coast Guard ships and boats. And in the Coast Guard, ships and boats really matter. And it was all about the parts, you know? So we always, and it took a while, but we really had a system where we knew exactly where the parts were. And the system, again, was fully integrated. Um, for instance, demand, uh, I mean, if you're running any logistics system, it's based on demand. And we don't, the port system does not automatically generate demand. So that, that's been challenging. We have to uh, rely on the components to estimate demand over a monthly basis and, and constantly update it. But you know, in a perfect world that we, we would have a system operating for PPE that would just automate, like, like most major logistics systems. Um, we still have 97 million in CARES Act funding um, and it's two year money again. So we have another year, year to obligate that funding. Um, and the only other thing I'd really like to emphasize is, so we're looking long-term when we talk about safety stock, the, <clears throat> the Department of Homeland Security overlooking for the components for PPE, again, has tried several different things. What we'd like to do is a DLA, the Defense Logistics Agency, has, a, has a, what's called a war stopper program. And there's different ways to look at it, but what we would like to see done is to essentially uh, have a contract with DLA. DLA would um, coordinate that contract um, with uh, vendors. And the requirement would be, again, well, hopefully we get this through this COVID-19 PPP and it's a distant memory in a couple months. And then hopefully there's no pandemics for two or three years. But when that next pandemic comes, that the vendor has a minimum amount of inventory for PPP and inventory that they will supply to us, to supply to DHS so we can get the, through the initial hump. Um, because in the past, just the way PPE is managed, it just, when, when you need it, when you really need it, it's very difficult to get to. We wanna have what I'm gonna call insurance stock or, or, or safety stock. We're in negotiations with that. My, uh, my guess is, um, um, I, my guess is that's not a cheap, <laughs> that, 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 that could be relatively expensive and we don't have an overwhelm. I'll have to get with Jack Kelly and learn the, learn the secrets of OMB and how to get money from OMB. But you know, that, or it's, got, it's gonna be expensive, but I, from my perspe perspective, it's really, it's really worth the risk. So that's what we're looking long-term. I don't know if it's gonna be successful. HHS also has a, a, a lar of course, a, a stockpile where we're starting negotiation with HHS to see if we could somehow get an initial quantities set aside for us but the we haven't figured that out yet but the, that's our really big push is well our our, our 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 number one push is continuing to get our our hard working component law enforcement personnel the pp they need secondly long term what are we going to do about pp we can't we can't be going up and down we, we got we got to smooth like any logistics system you got to smooth out the demand cycle somehow so, so we're hoping a war stopper program or something similar to that will help us And that's, that's it. Any, any questions at all, or? Yeah, Ken. Let me follow up on a, a couple of points you made. Um, and given your experience with the United States Coast Guard before coming to DHS, Chief Running as Support Officer, um, you know I think that this is uh, going to remain true. Uh, COVID nineteen uh, was a great example of I'll call an outside event that was not predicted hitting the United States. Um, and DHS having to very quickly mobilize resources, processes, people across diverse components um, to address a PPE in this case or other infrastructure uh, safety requirements. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the uh, positives and negatives of 
how DHS has historically done this, being underutilized, under under resourced, uh, and the ability to you know bring these components together and processes together quickly to address the challenge. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things. Uh, there's many different challenges across DHS. I think 250,000 people in in. Um, but uh, I, I, what I've learned, uh, and I've only been, uh, I think a six month mark was just this week. Uh, one thing I've learned is uh, each component brings different talent levels. And there, are, uh, in essence, there's always one or two components that does something very well. Okay, and it could, it could, it could be PPE, how do you distribute PPE? It could be, it could be uh, Eric Brown, uh, you know, vehicles or, you know, it, so when the crisis comes, I, I think what, what, what I feel like is, is a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, DHS is recognized um, as, a, as a critical agency for, for the United States government. So you do get attention from, you get, if you get $178 million from PP, that's, that's a really good thing. So it's right off the bat, you have that. Second, internally um, is, uh, and, and I, I think when I talk to my guys in LIO, a logistics integration office, and they were setting it up, there was somebody in CBP, uh, Customs and Border Protection, who had figured the whole thing out. And then so they sat down with the person in Customs and Border Protection and at least got port working, you know, and, and I'm sure there are other experts out there, but but my my thing is, uh, um, one, um, is, the, is the reputation that DHS has, but two, um, we've had components at, uh, doing different types of law enforcement missions or whatever missions for a long, long time, and they're very, very good at it. And no matter what we're doing, whether it's real property or COVID-19 PPE, what, what we're really trying to do is just take the shining light and bring everybody up back, uh, up together with a shining light, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, Eric or Al, uh, any other perspectives regarding that question of how uh, you know DHS or, or the components that ICE were able to mobilize uh, you know, very uniquely to address in this case, it was PPE requirements. Well, in my case, uh, you know, we we dealt with sanitization across the department, um, and of course, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, probably. Um, but you know, the questions were coming from the field, not just from the fleet management offices or for the components uh, property offices of how do we decontaminate our vehicles? <laughs> we still have to do our operations. I mean, we didn't get into the PPE in my section very much. Of course, I was familiar with PPE working from ICE, and then coming to headquarters. However, um, you know, we had to give them guidance on what to do. And, you know, we create, you know, my office created a document at least to put out at the department level, which was in line with CDC guidelines on how to decontaminate vehicles because the law enforcement folks still had to do their job. As, as Ken mentioned, you know, the, the criminals don't stop. Uh, they might, some of them might go sit down while the, you know, COVID's going on, but they're, they're still doing criminal things. Uh, investigations still have to continue. Uh, detainees still have to be transported. So, you know, there's a PPE requirement for that. And then how do you decontaminate the vehicle after? So, yeah, we, it, it's been busy. It's been busy. The past six, seven months have been extremely busy. Hey, this is Al. At the onset of uh, COVID-19, when I got the phone call from the chief financial officer uh, directing me to be the uh, the point of contact for ICE component. Uh, I didn't realize what he was putting me into. At the very beginning, it resulted in uh, being able to care for 20,232 uh, ICE personnel, uh, the major portion of that being law enforcement officers, about 7,500, and the rest being um, um, non-law non enforcement. Also, uh, at the very beginning, uh, there was uh, very little structure, and Ken already mentioned this, but uh, a uh, red team was put together under uh, Robert King at DHS, and uh, I was part of that team, and um, we actually showed what we were doing with our weekly report, because at the very onset, we didn't really have, a, a, it was, everything was so decentralized when it came to PPE, so by getting a weekly uh, report, we showed that to DHS as a potential adoption. They, I think they used some of it, but uh, the port actually turned out to be a very good tool uh, managed by DHS and being able to put in those requirements. And uh, what I found in ICE is that uh, I had to set up a logistic structure, uh, not only uh, myself, but I had to have two acquisition uh, senior advisors to add to the team. Uh, DHS allowed us to have a primary, which was myself, 
and then two uh, other individuals that would deal on the biweekly meetings with uh, with the pandemic uh, team from DHS. And um, I can I just like to put kudos out for both uh, Jama and uh, Mr. Uh, Diego Garcia. Uh, they did great in supporting uh, ICE requirements. And uh, the, uh, the fact that initially when we started out, the uh, structure was very, uh, there was really no structure. I had to develop that. So developed uh, for the 270 locations, I have five primary uh, programs within ICE and I have five main contacts for uh, for point of contact for PPE. But on top of that, there's 270 locations that we have uh, not only domestic, but international that had to be taken care of. And one of the uh, challenges that we initially had was that for example, the US embassies and the US mail was actually shutting down in many of the locations uh, because there was either no flights going into those countries or else uh, people were staying home. So uh, initially the orders uh, went into DHS around uh, March, April timeframe. And then we started receiving our first PPE in July. And uh, DHS worked out some wonderful things on being able to get us some KN95s and KN90s from FEMA, which worked out very well and supplemented our cloth face masks that we were using, some face shields and goggles. And then uh, next came the, uh, the 9205 respirators, which uh, was mentioned, we get about 333,000 uh, every month for the next 12 months for a total of about 4 million. And again, at the very onset of, of, of uh, COVID-19, DHS, along with all the other federal agencies, uh, were, in comp were really not in competition, but uh, the health and medical and first responders were getting um, almost everything. And uh, so we had to kind of wait in turn for, for that to develop for us to be able to get something um, either from the national stockpile or, or for the vendors to be, get to a point with the production that could start providing to the federal agencies. And as of this month, uh, uh, like Ken mentioned before, uh, all those orders that we did in phase one are all starting to come in at the same time. And so with people still uh, in phase one and trying to reconstitute to phase two for the COVID-19 to bring at least uh, 25 to 50% of employees back to work, which uh, uh, unfortunately, it, it seems like we're spiking again in many of the areas. Uh, we can't bring our people. Every time we try to bring them in, uh, someone gets uh, COVID-19, and then we have to uh, reduce back down again. So again, we're getting pretty saturated on PP&E. Uh, I think that's a wonderful thing, but we're also having to expand our storage. We're also trying to divert from our locations directly to our warehouse that we have in Maryland. And... Uh, we're doing quite well right now, and, and we're actually looking at our risk assessment to uh, reassess that to ensure that we have to take a look at the different phases uh, that occur. I mean, we're talking about phase one where it's up to 25%, phase two is up to 50%, and phase three basically to get everybody back to where we were before pre-COVID-19. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, initially, it was very challenging. Uh, I like uh, DHS with Jamie, I know it cannot be done without having a, a great team behind you. And um, it's, it's really worked pretty well for us. Excellent. Thank you, Al. Ken, uh, any, any last thoughts to add uh, before we shift to general discussion outside of PPE? No, I, I actually have to run, but I, I really appreciate the uh, chance to talk. And uh, I appreciate the subject too. Um, and being new, like real property was kind of tough where COVID-19 PP is certainly not expert, but I've, but I've been living the dream like everybody else, like Al and Eric uh, with the COVID-19 PP. It's, it's really important. And uh, I, uh, like Al mentioned, it was tough getting going just because what you're competing against uh, with, with the medical community, for instance, where, where it should be. Um, but it's, but it's, but it's been a, a great learning experience and a great uh, collaboration across the department. And uh, when we're dealing with across other agencies. Every, everybody has been very collaborative. It's, it's actually a good news story and what could have been a very bad news story, I think so. Yeah, very good. Well, Ken, thank you uh, for your presentation and for the work that thank you're you. doing over in logistics. Okay, appreciate Thanks. It. Thanks, bye -bye. Thanks for kind words on ice. <laughs>